영어원서 읽기 500번 읽기 도전 베니큘라 챕터 5 Chapter goes into his act The next morning, I was awakened by a scream Robert, Robert, come down here right away There's just something wrong in the kitchen For a moment, panic seized me I thought I should run out of dog food But then I remembered the events of the previous evening Mr. Murner came bouncing down, bounding down the stairs. Chester, Chester, I cried. Did you see Mr. Murner? His face has turned white. It's Bunnicula, isn't it? No, he said calmly. It's a shaving cream, you idiot. By now, the excitement in the kitchen was at full throttle. Full throttle. The table was covered with the Bunnicula's handiwork. There were white beans and white peas and white squash and white tomatoes and white, le white lettuce and white zucchini. What can it mean, Robert? Mrs. Morton was saying. I'm getting worried. One tomato is a curiosity, but this is unheard of. There must be something wrong with our refrigerator. That's it. It's turning all the vegetables white. But look... She said, I left these tomatoes on the window shelf and they are white too, and the squash I left in the bowl on the table. At that moment, Pete and Toby came into the kitchen. Holy cow, what's going on? Hey, maybe it's a vegetable blight, Mom. Could that be Robert? Did you ever hear of anything like that? Well, uh, no. Actually, that is, I've heard of a blight, and, but nothing like this. Chet leaned my way. This will take forever if we leave it up to them. Sometimes the human beings can be so slow. I started to answer him, but he was heading for the table. What about that friend of yours in the agriculture department? Oh, Tom Cregan? Could we call him and ask him if we were doing something wrong? It's DDT, Mom, Peter interjected. I know about that stuff. It's because you buy vegetables that aren't organic. All vegetables are organic, Peter. Mrs. Murnau replied. That's not what my teacher says. See, Toby, I told you this would happen. They're using chemicals on our food, and if you're not careful, you will turn white too. Like that? Robert, couldn't you take that shav shaving cream off your face? Oh yes, of course. Where's my towel? I know I brought it down with me. For, the mo for that matter, where, where was Chester? I'd seen him going toward the table. But I'd lost the track of him listening to all the talk about DDT. I just hoped that they didn't use any of that stuff while well, they grew a chocolate cupcakes. Pete, did you take my tower? Why would I take your tower, Dad? I don't shave. Just then, the door swung open. I could not believe my eyes. There was Chester, with Mr. Mulder's towel draped across his back and tied under his neck like a cape. That was strange enough. But on his face was an expression that sent chills down my spine. His eyes were wide and strange, staring. Uh, the corners of his mouth were pulled back in, in, in an evil grimace. His teeth were bared and gleaming in the morning light. He cackled menacingly and threw back his head as if he were laughing at all of us. I thought he had completely lost his mind. There's my towel. What's the matter, Chester? Were you cold? Mr. Bonro bent down to take the towel from Chester. Before he could lay his hands on it, Chester flipped over onto his back, closed his eyes, and folded his paws over his chest. It was a hideous sight. He opened his eyes wide. With a paws outstretched, he slowly lifted his head. His eyes glazed and vacant. Soon the upper half of his body followed, all in one smooth follow flow until he was in a sitting position. Hey dad, did you did you leave your brand did you leave your brandy glass out last night? Chester is acting a little weird. Well son, cats are funny creatures. I glanced at Chester. He wasn't laughing. Psst, Chester, what are you up to? I'm a vampire, you dolt. Can't you tell I'm trying to warn them? Well it's not working. You'd better think of something else. Chatter formed, frowned, apparently deep in thought. So you see, Toby, Mr. Murnau was explaining. All kids are as an individual as all people. Maybe he just wants to get our attention. 
is the Raya Kitika. Ordinarily, ordinarily, Chitra would have left the room upon being called the kitty cat, but he was lost in thought. Come on, Chitra, give my bag my towel. Give me back my towel. Mr. Muller moved toward Chitra. Chitra's eyes lit up. He looked at me and smiled. I sensed that I was not going to talk like that he had in mind. I was turned with the notion of slinking under the table when Chester picked me with his eyes. How deep they were! Like a black pools, I felt myself floating, lost in them, my will no longer my own. I felt an inexplicable urge to murmur, Yes, mister. When we walked slowly, steadily toward me, as he drew me a little nearer, I found myself unable to move. He stopped before me, never taking his gaze from me, and lunged. Lunged. Yo, Mom Chester. Be, uh, he stopped before me, never taking his gaze from me, and lunged. Yo, Mom Chester bit Harold on the neck. Oh, that wasn't a real bite, it was a Chester. That was a love bite. Isn't that cute? Love bite my foot. That hurt. Chester, what's the matter with you? I sputtered. Do I look like a tomato? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway, Harold. They don't understand. How can human beings read the same book I do and still be so thick? Our conversation was interrupted. Mrs. Morneau picked Chester up and curled him. I was praying she would not add an inj insert to injury by kissing my, his nose, which he hates more than anything. Poor Chester, do you need a little love? Do you know what I'm going to do? You big ball of puss, you. Uh, uh, I could tell that what was coming. I'm going to kiss you on your little nose. Yet I could tell that was coming all right. Chester knew better than to resist. He went to limp in Mrs. Simone's arms. And Mr. Monroe took his towel off Chester. I still don't know why he's wearing my towel, he said. I think he must be cold, dear. Here's your towel. Why don't you get his kitty sweater? Chester looked ill. And he can wear that all day. And Chester was being buttoned into his bright yellow sweater with a little purple mice and cowboy hats all over it. Mr. Monroe said, what about the Dutch papers? Shall I speak to Tom, Tom Cragen? Yes, dear. Mrs. Mulder said, why didn't you? I'm sure there's something explanation. In the meantime, I will change in my market. To tell you the truth, I'm really much more worried about the Chatter. We'd better keep, uh, keep, uh, we'd better keep our eye on him. Chatter and I did not speak until late in the afternoon. I was busy nursing my neck, and the Chatter was busy hiding under the sofa too, embarrassed to be seen. When, he, when we did speak at last, it was a brief exchange. Hey, Chester, I called when he finally crawled out from under. We don't have to worry about any vampire bunnies anymore. All you have to do is just stand outside his cage in the sweater, and he will laugh himself to death. Chester was not amused. That's right, make fun, all of you. No one understand. I tried to warn them, and they would heed. Now, I'm going to take matters into my own hand. Whereupon Chester and his 16 purple mice, went into the kitchen for dinner. Chapter 6 Harold Helps Out That night, I had an uneasy sleep. Strange noises emanated from downstairs. It sounded like a toenails were clicking back and forth on the floor. It must be Bonicula making his midnight run, I thought, although I had never known him to make a sound. And I smelled the funniest odor in the air, something familiar, though I couldn't place it. As the night progressed, it grew stronger and stronger until finally it tickled my nose and I sneezed myself awake. I jumped up Toby's bed, still sniffling, and headed down, headed down the stairs for the living room to find Chester to see if he could smell it too. The odor grew even stronger as I approached the living room. Standing in the doorway was Chester. A strange pendant hanging from his neck. Phew, Chester, I said. What are you wearing that awful thing for? It smells. Of course it smells, he replied. Here, I made a room for you to put it on. 
Are you kidding? That thing smells like garlic. It is garlic, Chedra stated at matter of factly. Why are you wearing garlic? I asked her, thinking, thinking that by this time Chetra was capable of anything. As we walked into the living room, I tripped on another piece of garlic lying in the doorway. Careful, said Chetra, watch your step. I surveyed the room and saw that it was strewn with garlic on the doorways, over the windows, and around the panicular's cage. The poor little fellow had buried his nose as far as possible under his blanket. I was about to follow his example and return to Tove's bed to bury my nose under the blankets when Chester grabbed my tail with his teeth. You're not living in this room until you put this on, he grumbled at me. I think that's what he said. I wasn't sure because he had my tail in his mouth. It's not polite to talk with your mouth full, Chester. Drop that tail. Meanwhile, my eyes were beginning to worry, water. Listen, Chester snapped at me, fortunately letting go of my tail first. The book said to use garlic. What book, I asked, the joy of cooking? Chester continued. The mark of the vampire says garlic re uh, renders the vampires immobile. What does that mean? It means that they can't go anywhere if there's garlic around. Well, I've got news for you, Shetra. I can't go anywhere either. The smell is killing me. But you've got to put it on. It says so in the book. If you don't put it on, I will put it on for you. No, Shetra, I said as my nose suddenly and involuntarily, involuntarily closed. I will live in this room right now. And I did. I was so sick to my stomach from this aroma that I decided to spend the early morning hours outdoors. As the dawn approached, it seemed that it would be a peaceful day. The sky was clear, the birds were singing, and I felt contented after my difficult night just to be lying in the grass, feeling the ladybird crawl out of my ears. Suddenly, the calm was broken. Strange piercing screams came from the area of the kitchen. Not again, I thought. Watch it turn the white now. As it happened, it was a Chester. There in the sink, ladled with soap, was the feline detective yelling his head off. Mrs. Muller was scrubbing him vigorously and, and from the sound of her voice, was in the middle of a long lecture. I don't know what's getting into you, Chester. You ne never played with a gallop before. I thought you hated the smell of it, and here you've got it all over yourself. Stop wiggling. You will get soap in your eyes. If you want to chew on something, I will get you some catnip. But stay out of my herbs. Herbs. Then she rinsed him off, rubbed him with a towel, and plunked him down in front of the stove to f finish drying. Shut the door. He hears at me. I'm preaching that silly woman. Doesn't she know cats don't get bath? What do you mean? I, I get bath all the time, I said, closing the door with my back foot. That's because you're too dumb to bathe yourself. Cats always bath themselves. It's a rule. Everyone knows that. Well, at least it smells nice in here again. I sniffed as I settled down next to Chester's by the stove. And it's all toasty worm here in the kitchen. Surely it smells nice again, he said, but now the house isn't safe anymore. What do you mean? I asked, getting closer. I mean it worked last night. The garlic worked. No more visitors turned white, did they? No, but that meant Bonicola didn't get out of his cage last night. Maybe he was just tired, I said, or maybe he was full. Don't be ridiculous, he replied. It was the garlic. He couldn't leave his cage, but tonight he will be free to roam again, and I've got to find a way to stop him and that isn't smelling. Mr. and Mrs. Murnau was hurrying in and out of the room, stepping over us late for work. Mrs. Murnau yelled up to Toby, Don't forget to take the stick out of the freezer when you get home today, Toby, and leave it on the table to defrost, and this time remember to put a plate under it. Chester ears plucked up. Of course, he said. That's what I'll do. And he strolled past me with a knowing smile. Mrs. Mull turned off the stove and left the room. It was too much for me to forget, uh, figure out, so I went to sleep on the nice warm kitchen floor. I was awakened by a bite on the ear. Chetra was sitting by me, looking very impatient. 
Boy, nothing wakes you up, he said. I've been yelling and poking at you for 10 minutes. I was dreaming, I answered defensively, about a place where there weren't any cats around to bother nice dogs and wake, up them, up, wake them up when they needed their rest. You can finish sleeping later, he said crisply. Right now, you have to help me. Do what? I asked. Get Bonicula out of the cage. I spring back. Get him out of the cage? I thought that was that you didn't want. I thought you said he was dangerous. What if he attacks me? Are you ashamed? Chetra replied. A prey the harmless little bunny? Harmless? I thought you said he was a threat to this house and everyone in it. Isn't that what you said? Isn't that what we've been talking about all this time? He is a threat, but only at night. During the day, he's just a very sleepy rabbit. And that's why we have to do it now. While the sun is still up, follow me, he said. There isn't much time. Toby stayed down here forever. And the others will be will be home soon. Boy, you must have been tired, Harold. You slept through the lunch. I followed Shadow into the living room. My heart was pounding as he unlocked the cage door with his paw. It looked as if he had it had years of experience opening locks. The door swung open. Benicula was sleeping peacefully. He did, however, look a little green around the, the gills, purple from the garlic. I was just wondering how a rabbit could have gills when Chester said, Okay, Harold, do your stuff. Well, I get my, what I need from the kitchen. Well, what do you want me to do? I can read your mind. Get him out of the cage and onto the floor and I'll be right back, Chester said. What? What? And what? I verbalized. How can I suppose to do that? Use your head, he answered, and he was gone. Looking at the cage, I realized that that was precisely what I would have to do. Until this moment, I had never had to face the possibility of actual physical contact with a real live rabbit. I looked upon my chore reluctantly. I seemed to recall my grandfather, telling me the one picked a rabbit up by its neck when it was tipped. This I attempted though the very idea sent my stomach churning. I squeezed my head through the tiny door and gently placed my teeth around the skin of the bunny's neck. To avoid any season of violence, I would never be one for the sport of hunting. I prepared to think of myself as the creature's mother, carrying it off to safety. Unfortunately, I couldn't carry it anywhere, for once my head was in the cage, it wouldn't come out again. I could go neither forward nor backward. At that moment, Chester appeared at the door, carrying in his mouth what looked every bit like a nice big juicy raw steak. My eyes popped, my teeth dropped the panicula, my mouth opened, and I began to drool. After all, I had missed the lunch. Chester, what are you doing with that steak? Haven't you gotten him out of there yet? I can't get either of us out of here. My head is stuck. Oh, Harold, sometimes I despair. Here, I'll get you both out. I should have done everything myself. He came over, dropped the sticks just a few feet away from me, and climbed up on my shoulders. You pull your head out when I push against the cage. Who get the sticks? I, I asked. Don't worry about the stick. Harold, just pull. I would have more motivation if I knew who is to get the stick. Yeah, Chester ignored me. I pulled, he pushed. I felt something go pop. We all fell in a jumble. Chester, the cage, Bonicula, and me. When I looked around, Bonicula was lying next to me, still sound asleep. There you are, I said. We got him out. Now let's eat. No dice, Chester said. Just read this to me so I will be sure I'm doing it right. And he handed me a book. That book again. Start at the top of the page, Chester said, as he picked up the stick. Why don't you read, and I will hold the stick. Mm, Chester replied. I took it to mean that I was to start reading, to destroy the vampire, and end his reign of terror. It is necessary to pound a sharp steak, Chester interrupted. A sharp steak? He asked. What does that mean? 
I will taste it and tell you it's, it, if it's sharp, eye open. Oh, never mind. Uh, this will do. It's a sirloin. Keep reading. To pound a sharp steak into the vampire's heart. This must be done during the daylight hours when the vampire has no powers. Okay, he said. This is it. I'm sorry I had to go this far, but if they don't listen, this wouldn't have been necessary. He dragged the stick across the floor and laid it across the inert bunny. Then with his paw, he began to hit the stick. Are you sure this is what they mean, Chester? Am I anywhere near his heart? He asked. It's hard to tell, I said. All I can really see are his nose and his ears. You know, he's really sort of cute. Chester was getting the glint in his eyes again. He was pounding away at the stake, harder and harder. Be careful, I cried, you will hurt him. Chester increased his attack. I was really getting worried when the door opened. And Mr. and Mrs. Merlin were suddenly with us in the room. Chester, Mr. Merlin screamed, what are you doing with my dinner? Robert, get the stick away from Chester. And what's the matter with the binicula? Why is he on the floor? Mr. Merlin took the binicula stick away. I wish that it it found, it found, it found, it found the farewell with, with a tear in my eyes. I wish that it found, I wish they had found the farewell with the tears in my ears. As the kitchen door swung open, Chester whispered with a cold de determination, All right, their last reserve, and dashed into the kitchen. Seconds later, he was back, carrying his water di with a dish between his teeth. He ran toward the binocular and with a mad yowl through the dish of, of water at the rabbit. Unfortunately, he was so hysterical that his aim was not the best. With water dripping from my ears, I watched Mrs. Morton pick the Chester up by the scruff of his neck and toss him unceremoniously out, out the front door. Robert, we are going to have to do with something about the cat. Look at this mess, dinner ring, and the poor bunny is out of his cage, and the herald is sopping wet. I tried to look as pathetic as I knew how. Oh, poor herald, Mrs. Morton could, as she dripped, uh, dried me up, you'd have... You're a, you've had a drop day, you and Bonicula. I don't know what's the matter with your friend, but unless he learns how to behave, he will just have to spend the night outside. Mr. Monroe, meanwhile, had restored Bonicula to his cage and the cage to the window shell. I couldn't believe it when I saw the Bonicula was still asleep, still asleep. And Mrs. M Mr. Monroe said the steak is ruined. When will I have all the habit? He deserved a treat anyway, don't you all have, old boy? I panted appropriately. After my delicious dinner, I turned my attention to the book still lying open on the floor. Another method of destroying the vampire is to immerse the body in water. The body will then shrivel, shrivel and disappear, as the vampire emits one last scream of terror. Phew, I thought. So that's what he was trying to do. Thank you, God. Thank goodness, I missed. I had no resist about missing a scene like that. Poor Bonicula. I looked over toward the cage, and there on the uh, there other side of the window was a pathetic tabby face looking in. His little nose was pressed against the window. I couldn't hear him, but from the movement of his lips, I could see he was a very, he was very unhappy. Poor Chester. As for me, Mrs. Muller spent the evening patting me and family chatted with me all night long. And of course, I'd had, I'd had my yummy steak dinner. So, it wasn't such a bad day after all. Except that uh, now, my steak was all gone. Poor Harold. Chapter 7. A New Friend in Me In the days that followed, the Chatter behavior was exemplary. He pulled and he could and he cleaned his paws and he rubbed up against everyone's legs to show what a good boy he was. I was getting worried. Chester acted that way only when he was something devious in the back of his mind. But I didn't know what it was. He had tried everything in the book to get rid of vampires and all his efforts had failed. But I knew from the expression on his face that something was definitely up. Of course, I didn't know for certain because he had not spoken to me since the stack incident. I guess he realized that my heart just wasn't in the destruction of the bunny vampire. In fact, I was beginning to like the 
The little fellow. The mourners were relieved by Chester's improved behavior. They didn't know how to account for his strange doing, but to their credit, they were willing to let bygones be bygones. The only disturbing factor in all our lives was the reappearance of the white visitors each morning in the kitchen. And yet, after a few days, even that stopped and the life seemed to return to normal. One evening, I dropped by Bonicula's cage to chat. I'd found myself doing that more and more since Chatter had stopped talking to me. Of course, Bonicula didn't talk back, but he was a good listener. I began to think of him as a friend. A strange one, granted, but one can always choose one's friend. I was distressed at this particular evening to see that he was dragging his ears as it were. He looked tired and listless. I felt his nose, and it seemed a little warmer than it should have been. I became alarmed. I ran over to Toby, who was doing a picture project on the floor, and began to bark, something I do only in case, only in cases of extreme Extreme emergency, since even I do not care for the sound. What's the matter, Harold? Toby asked without moving. Are there burglars? I ran to the cage and looked at Bonicula. I looked back at Toby and whimpered. Toby just looked confused. Do you want to play with Bonicula? Should I take him out of the cage? Whoop! I responded, indicating I hoped then that, that that was indeed what he should do. I, I will ask mom and dad, Harold. You wait here. He was back in a minute. Sh shaking his head. I'm sorry, Ma Harold, but Mom said that you can't play with the rabbit. It caused too much the co too much commotion. I looked down at the floor and whimpered again. Sorry, Harold. Maybe later when we are all in here together. <coughs> I regarded the binocular whose eyes met mine. He gave a little shudder, and I felt like crying. My brother was sick, and I didn't know what to do. <coughs> I wished I could tell Chester, but I knew it was no use. He was just too mad at me. I would have to solve this one out. Of, I would have to solve this one out on my own. That night, I couldn't sleep worrying about Bonicula. I decided to go downstairs and check on his condition. What I saw when I entered the living room horrified me. Bonicula was out of his cage on the floor, while Chester stood in front of him, a piece of garlic around his neck and his arms outstretched. Blocking the kitchen door, suddenly it all fell into place. Chester was a starving Bonicula. Of course, that's why he seemed so listless. And that's why the vegetables had stopped turning white. Chester had made it impossible for Bonicula to eat. Chester, I cried. Chester jumped a very high jump. What are you doing down here? He spat at me as he landed. I know what you're doing, Chester, and the, the jig is up. The little bunny never hurt anybody. All he's doing is eating his own way. What do you care if he's drained a few days vegetables? He's a vampire, Chester snarled. Today vegetables, tomorrow the world. I think perhaps you're overstate, overstating you, your case, I suggested cautiously. Go back to bed, Harold. This is rather than the two of us. In and may seem harsh, but I'm only being cry, cruel to be kind. Who's be being kind to? I wondered as I went back upstairs. The tomatoes and the zucchinis of the world? Maybe a few cabbages? It just didn't make sense. But I could see I wasn't going to get anywhere with the Chester tonight. Tomorrow, however, would be another story, and I was determined that by hook or by crook, my friend Bonicula would eat by sundown the next day. Chapter 8 the jester in the dining room. I realized that there was nothing I could do for Bonicula during the day, since he was sleeping, but that gave me time to plan my strategy. At first, I thought I would bring food to his cage, but then it occurred to me that Chester must be taking everything away that was given to him. Pete and Toby usually left a letters for Bonicula during the day while he was sleeping, and the Chester ever watchful, probably nah, now, nah, but it's evening just before the rabbit walk. No, there would have to be another way. I thought and thought all afternoon, and I could see that Chester had done a good job of isolating Bonicula from his food. There was no way I could think of to overcome Chester's game plan. As the evening drew closer, and I grew more and more frantic, I stumbled into the dining room, 
and they saw the answer to my problems sitting before me on the table. It was a big bowl of salad. All I had to do was get Bonicula to the salad and let him get his fill before the family came in to eat. With the funny white dressing on it, they would never notice it if a few vegetables were white. I ran to the hallway to check the clock. 6.15, it would be 15 minutes before the sun went down and the Bonicula woke up. I would then need at least five minutes to get him from his cage to the table and feed him. All I had to do was make sure that no one came into the room until he had finished. I needed a good 20 minutes at least. I went back into the room now. Chetro was asleep on his brown velvet chair, shedding in his sleep, still worn out from the previous night's activities. I checked upstairs. Toby was reading in his room the last chapter of Treasure Island, I noticed. Pete, who should have been doing his homework, was listening to record in his room. I ran down to the kitchen. Hello, Harold, Mr. Morner said as I came through the door. What's new? Other than a rabbit starving in the next room and an imminent attack on your salad bowl, nothing, I thought. I stood at her feet and panted. He scratched my head. This gave me a moment to check out how far <coughs> she was in her cooking. Sorry, Harold, she said. I have to baste this chicken. I noticed the oven timer still had a fit 35 minutes to go. It will be tight, I thought, but I can make it. Now where is Mr. Murnau? I went to the front door and whimpered loudly. Mrs. Murnau followed me. Are you waiting for Daddy Beryl? He will be so home soon. Soon is the good enough. How soon? I whimpered again. Patience, boy. He's late for meeting. He should be here any time. She went back into the kitchen, and I checked the clock. 6.25. It was getting dark, and Chester was still asleep. Time to swing into action. Having watched Chester under the locked bonicula's cage, and having participated in that unfortunate steak episode some days earlier, I knew I would have no problem getting bonicula out. I just had to be a little more careful right position right head, so I so I wouldn't 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 find myself in the humiliating pre uh, predicament of getting stuck to a second time. My time was perfect, with the binocular swinging peacefully from my teeth. I made my way stealthily toward the dining room as the last rays of sunlight gave way, the, gave, gave way to the dark of night. One inside, once inside the dining room door, binocular awakened in great bewilderment. It is not every day after all that one that, that one finds oneself upon awakening, hanging from the jaws of a fellow creature, even so caring and gentle a creature as myself. Benicola opened his eyes wide and turned his face as best he could to me. I jumped up onto the nearest chair and placed the rabbit safely on the ta table's edge. Okay, I whispered, till you your dinner, go to it, get your fill as fast as you can. Poor bunny. I was standing guard. I don't know that Bonicula fully understand, understood what was going on, but the sight of the vegetables piled high in the center of the table stand he sent him scurrying in their direction. He was very hungry, as luck would have it, and as I should have anticipated, Chester's sense of timing was as as tight as my own. No sooner had Bonicula reached the edge of the salad bowl than the door swung open and Chester bounded into the room. He surveyed the sands seen frantically. I was unable to act fast enough. Upon seeing Bonicula about to enjoy his first bit of nourishment indeed, Chatter leaped across the table, seemingly without touching the floor, chairs, or anything else between himself and our furry friend, and landed directly on top of the bunny. No, no, you don't, he she shrieked. Bonicula, not sure what to do, jumped high in the air and landed. And with a great scattering of greens smacked in the center of the salad bowl, lettuce and the tomatoes and carrots and cucumbers went flying all over the table and onto the floor. Chetter flattened his ears, wiggled his real and and smiled in anticipation. 
to cat of germs. This is known as the attack position. Run, Bonicula, I shouted. Bonicula turned in my direction as if to ask where. Anywhere, I cried. Just get out of his way. Chester sprang. Bonicula jumped and in the flash of a second, they had changed the positions. Chester now found himself flat on his back, owing to the slipperiness of the salad dressing in the bowl. And the Bonicula, too dazed to even think about food now, halbert, quivering, quivering on the table. Chester was having a great deal of difficulty getting back on his feet, but, and, uh, but I knew it was only a matter of a second before he was uh, attacking again. And I knew also that Bonicula was too petrified to do anything to save himself, so I did the only thing I could. I barked very loudly and very rapidly. The whole family rushed through the door. Mr. Muller must have just, uh, home, just uh, come home because his coat was still on. Oh no, cried Mr. Muller. That's it, Chester. That, this is Chester's last stand. Chester rolled his eyes heavenward and didn't even try to move. Mom, said Toby, tugging at his mother's arm. Look at Bonicula. How did he get out of his cage? He looked scared. Of course he's scared, Mr. Mulner said. We probably forgot to latch his cage and he got out. And I think Chester has been chasing him. Toby put his face close to the rabbit. Mom? Doesn't Bernicola look kind of sick? Would we take them all to the bed to see if any damage was done, she answered. I started to whimper. No need for me to go to the bed. Mr. Molo patted my head. We may as well take a head of the lawn, he said. He's probably due for his shots. Mrs. Molo carefully picked the chester out of the salad bowl and carried him by the scruff of the neck to the kitchen. I'm going to give chester a quick bath. She said to Mr. Mono, why don't you put together a fresh salad? Toby and you and Peter put Bonicula back in his cage and then clean up the table. I didn't stick around for an assignment. This was not the time to be in the way. And besides, I now had a whole evening and night ruined, worrying about the next morning's visit to the vet. This little act of mine, I thought, has been a disaster in more ways. Than on than one. Chapter nine. Old world that's at that ends well almost. Looking back on that night, I remember thinking that this whole mess could never be resolved happily. What would have become of Benicula, my new friend who was suffering from starvation, and what a chatter of my old friend who seemed to flip the and his lid. And if your pardon to expression was in the dog's house with the manos, a far greater concern of that time, of course, it was my own picture. For that night, all that consumed my thoughts was the fear of the next day's injection. And all seemed hopeless indeed. But looking back on the next day, I can tell you the happy endings are possible, even in situations that fronted of complication as this one was. Early the next morning, we all piled into the car, and some of us regretted of the reluctance of others and trembled on our bed. And by afternoon, we all in our ways to solving our problems. The bed worked everything out very nicely, and he discovered the Bonicolas were suffering from extreme hunger. I could talk them. A little then jar and the practice starving solid food. The doctor decided he should be put on his rookie diet for get got better. So Bonicula was immediately getting his characters, he, which he drank eagerly. After he finished, he looked over and he knew greatly on his taste and weight. Chatter was diagnosed as being emotionally offered a lot. His just tested his starting session of a catechiatrist to work out the dog that we called a case of a sibling rivalry, Bonicula. I asked the chatter later what sibling was, but he wasn't speaking to me. So I looked it up, looked it out. Is it like a brother or a sister? And sibling rivalry means you are competing with your brother or sister for attention. I was sure about the chatter's problem, but it sure the less of Toby and Pete. As for me, well, I came out of the best. The doctor was all set to give me a shot, and the nurse came into my car. Wait, doctor, this dog doesn't need to shot, yet it's too soon. So I got a pat of the head and the dog pot on his head. These days, everything's back to normal in the mother's household. 
almost. But Nicola liked the, the diet so much, but the Monlose kept him, kept him on it. And well enough, but Chetro no used me turning white since. Chetro, of course, insists that this prove of theory. Obviously, Harold, the wicked by the vegetables to take the place of the vegetable juice, so Bodicula has no need to go roaming anymore. That is not a vampire, I said. Nonsense, he's a vampire, all right, but he's a modern vampire. He gets his juices from the blender. Case closed, Sherlock, I queried. Case closed. Oh, Chester. Yes, Harold? What are those two funny marks on your neck? Chester jumped and I laughed. Very funny, he said, as he began to bathe his, his terror. Very funny. But Monroe was never in anything of Chester's theory. The change the market. After these days, he believed that they, the victims of the curious with the vegetables of bread bright. He still doesn't see anything. He snuggles up next to me with the, the fireplace we take a long cozy snoozes together. One night, I sang him a lullaby in his obscure diet and his homeland as if as he slept as peace, very peacefully. At that night, Chester had come. Now about Chester. I said that everything back to no more. Almost. Naturally, Chester would be almost. He's been seeing us as psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. He takes his therapy very seriously. The other morning, I was trying to get him to sleep when Chester came over and nudged me in his ribs. Harold, do you realize me never really communicated? I mean, really communicated. I opened one eye cautiously. And in order to communicate to Harold, you have to really be in touch with yourself. Are you in touch with yourself, Harold? Can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I am in touch with the minis, the minis me, and which uh, reach up to the unis means you. I closed my eyes. I used to be a am. He talks like that all the time. He no longer read a great poor night, other guy a poor night. He write out a bonicula. There was no more talk about the vampires. The mark of the vampire just sits in the useful obsolete on his shop. Right now he's reading of finding yourself by screaming a lot. And the other night, when I heard the most awful noise coming from the basement, I didn't even bat an eyelid. I knew it was just a chatter finding himself, as he called it. He explained it to me he's getting in touch with his kitten hood, and I've told him that's fine. Just let me know what it's going to do, and ask him to be elsewhere. I have enough problem in Chester's adventure. So, that's my story. And the story of this mysterious chain, who no longer seems quite so mysterious, and was definitely no longer strangers. I will present the pact as clearly as I could, and I'll leave it to you, dear listener, to draw yourself on, on conclusions. I must know the relatives close, since it is Friday night, Toby's night at the Strabley night, and I can hear the quickly celebrate. I can only hope to cover to chocolate cupcakes with the cream filling.